the next speaker is someone uh, I have the pleasure of meeting uh, almost every week, and uh, I'm very glad to quickly introduce him today. Uh, Dr. Hisham Shukair is a professor in CAXT in Riyadh here in Saudi. Uh, he's a veteran at the University of Virginia, where he received all his degrees. Currently, uh, he's the co-director and principal investigator of a very ambitious uh, center. Uh, it's called the Center of Excellence for Aeronautics and uh, Astronautics. And uh, they have this joint research effort between them and Stanford. So the title of this talk will be Autonomous Vision-Based Navigation and Control for Robotic Space Objects. Uh, Professor Shokari, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Bilal. Yeah, it's, uh, it's nice to be here. And thanks, uh, Eric, and thanks to Joanna as well for setting everything up. And I'm honored today to present uh, some of the work that we've been doing with uh, Stanford University in collaboration with the King Abdelaziz City for Science and Technology. So the talk I wanted to talk about today was one of the projects that we have that's active with the center which deals with auto autonomous vision-based navigation and control. And here I selected robotic space objects. It's more general, it's a little vague in terms of objects, but I think as you'll see with the presentation that, you know, as we see with robots in space that, you know, maybe objects is the, the word to categorize things. So here, the name of the center is Center of Excellence for Aeronautics and Astronautics, uh, CEAA. One of our collaborators with Stanford is uh, Professor Simone D'Amico, and he's representing the Space Rendezvous Laboratory at Stanford. And some of his students that we've been working with, uh, Justin Kruger, uh, Thomas Liu, and some researchers that we have from the King Abdelaziz City for Science and Technology, CACS, uh, Ibrahim and Omar, and Abdelaziz al Fadl. So just a little brief about what type of robotic space objects that we've been looking into and that we've been interested with our research. So we've been focusing on space robots for on-orbit servicing, robotics for debris removal, and more recently with the assistive free flyers. Here I brought some examples where the originally known as the Restore-L, where the name was changed recently is the OSAM-1, and that's part of NASA's exploration and in services, uh, in space services. The Astro-B, which is on board the International Space Station, so we've been looking at different trajectory optimization methods, and we're hoping with our collaborators at Stanford to actually test some of the algorithms that we've been designing. And then something we've been looking at recently, with, which is I think is interesting, where people are looking into Clear Space One. So that's one of the up and coming um, space missions that are looking to get started soon. And you can see from these that these missions are gonna require different types of robotics, maybe things that are not available now. So there's opportunity for innovation there. And you can see with this clear space where there's an object here, a space object, which was part of a previous mission where they wanna go and remove it down to the closer to the atmosphere in the lower orbit. And you can see here with the Restore L where you can do servicing and refueling and you, you know that these different types of robotics and arms that are gonna be needed, as well as the autonomous approximation of the uh, dynamics. So some of the properties we've looked at in space objects, so accuracy requirements. So in order to be nearby an object, you have to maneuver nearby the accuracy is gonna be much higher that's needed. So grasping technologies for space environments. So legacy fleet maintenance, commercial surfacing, cooperative observatory servicing, on-orbit assembly is what other things that people have been looking into, which is relatively new. Specialized tools. So that's one thing we've noticed with other groups where you know designing new materials that would help you for grasping. So constraints and limitations, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have with uh, vision-based navigation. And here the NASA's Exploration and In-Space Services uh, Department. So here I just wanna talk a little bit about the motivation. 
So accurate relative posed information can benefit various missions involving on, like I mentioned, on orbit servicing, in addition to space situational awareness. So this is one graph that gives us an idea in terms of what type of navigation accuracy is required in relative to the intersatellite distance. So as we can see for servicing and repair, we need a much higher accuracy in terms of what's currently available. Where de debris removal with different methods and different technologies, there could be ways around that where you don't need a higher level of accuracy. And as well as LEO swarms where, you know, there's a good enough distance here, as well as small body exploration. So historically, there've been a few missions that have focused on formation flying. And the reason I like to mention formation flying is because that was one of the first introductions to distributed space systems. And, and it's something that we've been focusing on at the CEA more, more recently. So the first mission, the GRACE mission, where there was two twin uh, spacecraft in 2002, uh, the Tandem X and the Prisma space mission. So each one of these space, space missions demonstrated you know, new technologies and new abilities in terms of formation flying. To give a little bit more of the detail and the scale, so the distance you can see here is much greater distance, plus or minus 50 kilometers, as well as the distance here per ton. So in September 2005, there was data that was recorded and as we can see here, the, there's some significant results in terms of formation flying. With the Tandem X mission, there was, there was also some significant progress here in terms of the distance requirements. And you can see some of the images that were processed here showed much higher accuracy from a distributed space system. Some of the other technologies that people have been researching, for example, with Capella Space Corporation, to give an idea of how you could have a small launch stage, but then the vehicle could open up in orbit, and this could allow for a number of new applications and designs. And, you, and if you look up uh, Capella, you can see that they have an upcoming mission and they're pretty successful in terms of uh, new innovative uh, space systems. So one of the more important missions that we've worked on with the S-Lab was the Starling-1 CubeSat space mission where there's a design for autonomous swarming for deep space navigation and exploration. The launch date for this mission is scheduled for 2022. And this is just an example of how vision-based navigation could be used for swarms. Here, this could be a swarm, for example, of four satellites that have some distance away from a desired trajectory. And we wanna be able to line these up to create, in essence, a distributed space system. So this shows an example of an optical experiment which is being conducted in uh, being prepared for, which is known as a Star Fox. So this concept is enabled by using an algorithm angles only identification for tracking and estimation. So the idea here, we want to use identification and tracking using multiple hypotheses, as well as purely kinematic rules. So the relative orbit elements allow for co coarse closed form solution and and initialization of sequential filter. The unscented Kalman filter required to capture nonlinearities of measurements of the models and a time update, which can be linear using STM or nonlinear using GVE. So the example here is a standard satellite and we use the orbit determination using vision-based calculations here and estimations. So one of the facilities we've used at, at Stanford is uh, hardware in the loop. So this is some, something Simone has been working on. We've been collaborating to uh, further advancements and developments. And we're looking also to explore the idea of doing a patent in terms of possibility of doing this for other 
spacecraft validation and verification. So it's a unique setup where we have lenses for the image processing. And this is done in a simulated environment. And you can see some of the error, estimation error that we achieved. So here we go over the different number of orbits and the relative error that was achieved for a simulation test. Or another interesting, let's say, space mission, autonomous nanosatellite swarming system. Here you have nanosatellites looking to explore a meteorite and different vision-based technologies that could be used for to control and guide the distributed space system to achieve different levels of uh, data gathering. So diving a little bit deeper in terms of the autonomous nanosatellite uh, guidance and navigation control architecture, starting with the sensors, be it RF and optical, using the navigation and then we've explored different deep reinforcement learning methods to help improve the guidance and relative orbit estimate uh, state estimation for the control. And this results in a higher accurate low thrust control of actuators. So one thing I thought it would be good to present, this was something that was developed with Simone's lab and it's something we've been implementing on this project is the research methodology re, a research methodology that's used to develop these research experiments and the space missions and kind of the how we can contribute to the literature i think so if we if we have access to a space flight a space flight mission or space space flight mission data or if we're part of a space flight mission this will generate a long list of lessons learned and challenges to expect. So given these lessons learned and challenges, we move into having advanced multi-satellite mission design. And as you can see that there's been a lot of interest recently with CubeSat missions and distributed space systems, as well as in orbit servicing and debris removal. So we believe that this could be an interesting opportunity to explore applications that could be driven to help develop the research. So given these mission designs, we have a list of requirements and objectives. This would motivate us and inspire us to create new navigation and control algorithms that would control multiple satellites in a distributed way. Therefore, designing prototype algorithms which can be which can then be tested and you can see just a brief glimpse here into some of the hardware that's used to simulate space environment as well as to validate and verify the algorithms that have been developed and this completes the cycle here with which you know the implementation the embedding and the integration into different spacecraft missions so I thought this would be a good opportunity to help get an idea of how uh, the research is done on this project. So one thing I thought it would be interesting, a lot of people talk about autonomy in self-driving cars and robotics. So here I found an interesting definition about autonomy for robotic space systems. So in terms of when we talk about space objects, what do we mean here by autonomy? So I think the European ECSS space seg seg segment operability standard does a good job of defining autonomy for robotic space systems. So I'll just read this quickly. Onboard autonomy management addresses all aspects of onboard autonomous functions that provide the space segment with the capability to continue mission operations and to survive critical situations without re relying on ground segment intervention. And this is normally needed for deep space missions or if there's lack of communication or even in the absence of GNSS. So one thing I liked about the way they presented different levels of autonomy with regards to space systems. So the first level they have is the E1 level is the level of execution. The mission execution from ground control 
limited onboard capability for safety issues, the functions, the real-time control from ground for nominal operations, execution of time tag commands for safety issues. And then here, the naming or the classification, we could say whether it's a real-time control with pre-programmed sequences, level E2, execu ex execution of pre-planned ground-defined mission operations on board, capability to store time-based commands in an on onboard scheduler, and here the classification typically is pre-planned. Execution of adaptive mission operations on board, level E3. These are typically event-based autonomous operations and they're done with the onboard computers or the onboard technology that's available for operation. These typically are known as semi-autonomous and sometimes referred to as adaptive. The highest level here, level E4, execu execution of goal-oriented mission operations on board. Here, goal-oriented missions or replanning, essentially planning and replanning during mission operation operations. And these are goal-oriented where, for example, you have the push button where you push a button and then from there on, you have your autonomous system would take over control of the objective. So throughout my experience with autonomous design that typically you do start in, in somewhat of a sequence. Sometimes you could start in the E3 level, depending on the optimizers and other things that you're using to design your controller. But it's interesting to see which level that different systems would fall under and that way for us to know, you know which system or which level we want our system to operate. So here, just a background about vision-based navigation in terms of how it relies heavily on angles-only navigation. The example here is a space object where you have swarms to operate autonomously. The observer space objects obtain bearing angle measurements to targets via onboard cameras. So the example here, you have a target. As you can tell, it's difficult to identify targets in space. So this is one of the major challenges with this research. And next, given your, given your measurements, you wanna determine a trajectory or you wanna estimate what's the trajectory of this moving target. So this overcome limitations, which enable autonomous navigation, in addition to absolute and relative orbit estimation under realistic operational constraints. The, architect, the architecture that was used here for vision-based navigation where Assuming an absolute orbit path with an observer, we have, for example, non-cooperative targets that we want to estimate different features or properties about their movements. So one of the challenges here, you can see the sensor fields of view, which is a constraint, could be a perception constraint, and your non-cooperative targets, which are in a relative orbit paths. So given different sensing technology, we want to be able to extract different attributes of the target. Here, the state components were defined by a local observer, six times absolute orbit elements, three optional empirical accelerations, two variable sensor biases, one optional ballistic coefficient, so here per target, we expect six relative orbit elements. This is typ typical, three optional differential and another optional differential. So per swarm observer, we have included a optional differential clock offset as well as a drift rate. And this shows a brief overview of how an observer can use angles only measurements to determine either the trajectory or the pose of the target. Here, the measurements include a local observer with two bearing angles per target, one sensor attitude quaternion, and one optional position velocity and time vector. Per remote observer, there are two bearing angles per target, one sensor attitude quaternion, 
and one position velocity time vector. Here are the objectives that we have set for our vision-based navigation is to enable robust and accurate results with using only onboard technology. So this results in autonomous localization of agents for future space object swarm configurations. Here we begin by an initialization. This could be either done through a ground segment or through a GNSS or through a receiver. And as we can see that this is course absolute orbit estimate at a single epoch, multi-hypothesis tracking. And this is fed into our iterative batched, which is done by a least squares method. So these results are sent to the refinement where we also include the vision-based sensor and the camera image, as well as the, bangle, the bearing angle measurements. And in this method, we implemented an unscented Kalman filter, which takes in the target bearing angles and vision-based sensor attitude and sends back updated swarm orbits and covariances, as well as accepting position, velocity, and time variables. So here the GNS, GNSS receiver is optional and could improve estimates of the accuracy as well as the position and velocity. So the approach that was implemented, like I just mentioned, the unscented Kalman filter with nonlinear models to preserve higher order information and resolve the complete swarm state without requiring maneuvers. This example shows how using candidate measurement, whether assigned or the existence of large measurement error, measurement ambiguity, as well as target ambiguity. So here we apply multi-observer measurement assignment algorithms, perform filter time updates using numerical propagation and measurement updates. And, it, and we see here that we have a result which gives us an updated swarm with state estimates and covariances. So this new target identification and measurement assignment algorithm leverages measurements from multiple observers for vastly improved performance. So one of the most important parts of vision-based navigation is pose estimation. So using a mono, monocular camera on board the space object, we can determine the pose of a non-cooperative target space object relative to the camera. So this is an interesting concept and I think it leverages recent developments in image processing, as well as available hardware and images from previous missions, simulation tools, as well as estimation and approximation. This method is a data-driven algorithm. And the data here could be from real flight missions or it could be generated from the S-Lab hardware that's available. In this case, you can see a single 2D image with auxiliary data in the online part, which is a data-driven pose estimation. We have object detection and cropping to focus on the object that we want to determine. Here we perform key point regression and perspective endpoint. The spacecraft pose estimation data set has been created based on both space missions as well as developments that have been done at the SLAP. These include 3D model, orbit, illumination information object detection and key point regression training. And as we see here, we have an example of what a pose output would look like based on this technology. As I mentioned, the spacecraft pose estimation data set or speed is a collection of over 15,000 images, as well as recent developments of 300 images from hardware simulations. And the idea here behind the hardware is to simulate a space environment. 
So this is a very interesting research approach that's been developed at Stanford, looking into mimicking a space environment and being able to generate data sets that could be used for validation and verification of future vision-based navigation and control. So one of the scenarios that the students have been working on was the Mars science mission. Seems everybody nowadays is focusing on Mars. So I thought it would be good to add to the excitement. So here we have a Mars science mission. We have four CubeSats in centric Mars orbit taken distributed measurements of Martian atmosphere and ionosphere. So this is the idea of the mission that would be performed. So with, for example, four distributed satellites or CubeSats in this case, from which two swarm observers conduct autonomous angles only navigation and they're separated 50 to 150 kilometers in inter-satellite separations. So for this example, we used a ground truth of 120 by 120 Martian gravity with atmospheric drag, solar radiation pressure, third body solar gravity. Modeling of observer clock drifts and target visibility. And the S lab has hardware in the loop, image measurements using a BCT nano star tracker and S labs optical stimulator. Here, the swarm orbit was defined and you can see the different variables that were used for each of the um, CubeSats. So this gives you a little bit closer look at the Space Rendezvous Lab optical simulator. As we mentioned, it has a Blue Canyon technology nano star tracker. This is off the shelf lenses, display and motors. So I think what's really unique about this optical simulator is the way the technology is used and the way the potential it has for future space missions that rely on vision-based navigation. Throughout the simulation, you can see the observer camera images and here focusing on the swarm absolute orbit, each of the absolute orbit estimates for the various positions, as well as the relative orbit estimates for the radial position, the normal position and the tangential position. So here we, we're plotting the error. Finally here, the clock offset estimate and the clock drift rate estimate. And we can see as the time propagated here in the swarm relative orbits, we can see the various maneuvers that were achieved for the different space objects. So in conclusion, and talking a little bit about the next steps that we've been looking at. So the significance of these results is demonstrating autonomous navigation for varying formation types and target separations and guaranteeing long-term robustness. Absolute orbit accuracy of less than one kilometer and relative orbit accuracy of less than or equal to 0.5% in terms of the target range, which is sufficient to enable some of the proposed science goals that we've been looking into. The treatment of realistic conditions, including limited ground contact, representative sensor noise, and regular eclipse periods. Some of the future improvements and testing as part of the absolute and relative trajectory planning are the algorithmic improvements, development and testing of prototype flight software using sensors in the loop, as well as CubeSat avionics. Some of the generalizations and expansions of architecture, optimization of observer attitude to keep targets within the visual VBS field of view, formal characterization of swarm observability using graph network topologies. So these are some of the ideas that the students have been having in terms of 
what could be a next step? How can we improve the developments that have been made? And what are still some of the open challenges? So an application to other dynamical environments and mission types. So like, for example, the with the Mars example, where different environments, as well as with the, with the asteroid um, rendezvous, could be another type of environment that still people don't know how to model, or it's still relatively new, where not a lot of work has been done. So with that, it uh, looks like I ended a little bit early. So I just wanted to thank a special thanks to Simone D'Amico for collaborating with us at CAXT and some of the publications that we've done collaboratively and some that have done, been done by the S-Lab. Great, thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hisham. So uh, Eric's question is, can you elaborate on the hardware implementations and eventual mission launch schedule? Okay, so the hardware implementation is pretty interesting that they have there at the S-Lab. So they do have two robotic arms. So these robotic arms can help to, to execute different maneuvers, which is gonna help in terms of different trajectories or different types of maneuvers that we would expect with space objects. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting part of being able to simulate a space environment. So that's been one of the interesting parts of the hardware. So there's really two parts of the hardware. So you have the Tron area where you wanna simulate the space environment. And then you have your optical experiment where you have images already from either could be from the hardware or they could be from actual space missions. So I think there's, you know, different parts of the hardware that we can, you know, look at different parts and, and see how we could learn from, you know, the different components of the hardware that's used. So that's one thing I really like about this project where, you know, there are, there's opportunities to have hardware in the loop. And I think that helps with the verification and the validation. So the other question in terms of launch mission schedules. So I think you guys are familiar. <laughs> this probably changes a lot. <laughs> so there is one scheduled for 2022. And we actually had another space mission. We were looking into a technology demonstration with between CAX and Stanford, as well as the Italian company Gauss. And there's a fourth partner, I forget um, their name. But these things change all the time. So I think it's hard. I, I wish we could. So we're hoping that, you know, in the near future that we could hopefully to schedule it, to have a mission launch schedule. And I know from other projects within the center, um, for example, like with the Astro B where things are already available, where we wouldn't have to wait, for example, for a launch date. But I know with this project in particular, that most of the results would depend on a technology demonstration in terms of implementing, you know, the, the designs and the algorithms that have been made into a technology demonstration space mission. So for now, I would say, you know, hopefully the 2022, as well as the Restore L mission, I, I noticed they changed the date. That was something I haven't been updated about, but I remember that we were gonna contribute to some of the trajectory optimization that was done for that space mission in collaboration on another project with our center. But yeah, hopefully I'll keep you updated, Eric, and really thank you. Thank you once again for, for having us. So how do you communicate your work with Saudi youth? So this is something that's still relatively new here in Saudi Arabia in terms of the space sector and you know, aviation sector. So we've done different activities. There's, I could talk about Saudi in general in terms of how Saudi Arabia communicates with its youth. There is a scientific competition that a lot of high school students participate in. And that's something I've been impressed with. And I'm sure other people here in Saudi Arabia might be familiar with. So I think 
communicating with the youth either through events, you know, public outreach, but I think having, you know, a more annual thing, like a more uh, periodic or more dedicated thing, like once a year, for example, having a scientific competition. So this is something we're still working on. And I know that a lot of people are interested in. And I think, you know, with kids having things hands on, and I think with the high school students, I've really been impressed, you know, with their ability to actually work on research projects. So I think there's kind of like an untapped market there where with our center, for example, if we could create, you know, maybe like a summer boot camp where we could have some of these, you know, top talented high school students or even, you know, underprivileged high school students as well, where, you know, we don't want to discriminate and there's different opportunities in different locations. So I think that's kind of an untapped market here in Saudi Arabia that, you know, there's more opportunity, I think, to, you know, communicate our research, especially with the space sector, given that it's something fairly new here in Saudi Arabia. So I'm hoping that, you know, we'll start some of these scientific competitions and we'll have, you know, more public awareness and more public outreach activities. And I think that's something we've done historically at CAXT. And I think like the public outreach, it's kind of helpful, but if the kids aren't having fun or having hands-on, then you see, then they won't, I don't think they're gonna benefit from it as much. But from my experience with the scientific competitions, I've seen that that forces students, you know, to get hands-on, to learn how to do research, whether basic or scientific, and then, you know, maybe designing prototypes as well as looking into, you know, new ideas that even for us as, you know, senior researchers or scientists that we don't think about. And I think that's one thing I learned and a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people say this where, you know, the, the high school students, their inexperience is their value. Because for us, we become so experienced and we know things and we say, okay, this isn't, these are constraints and we shouldn't do this where I think for them, their inexperience adds value where you know, they can be more creative or more imaginative, I think, in terms of being innovative and in research. So that's another, that's another good point, um, Eric, that, that the industry is still relatively new. And I think it is kind of up to us to, to, you know, to ensure that these aerospace engineers you know, have research positions or have industrial positions or jobs here within Saudi Arabia. So that's something that's still relatively new. And I think it is part of vision 2030 where they want to expand you know, into new sectors that are untapped, for example, like the space and aeronautics sector. So I think that's still a big challenge. Like you said, what these students that go and major in aerospace, you know, when they come back, there's how many aerospace engineering positions are available. So I think this is still an open challenge that, that I think that, you know, somebody at Cox or, some, you know, somebody at KSU or somebody at KAUST could help, you know, to help them either feel a little bit comfortable about majoring in aerospace or feel that, you know, there's some job security in terms of being able to find, for example, like the Saudi Space Commission, which was recently founded, where they look to hire a lot of aerospace engineers. And I think with, with our center as well, where we target you know, aerospace engineers, mechanical, electrical. So it, I would love to see more. And I think that you know, we're going in that direction. And I'm sure Eric's going to help as well. <laughs> so we look forward to that. Really, thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Hisham. There, there's one more question. So a question from Pan Zhao. Are there a lot of dynamic uh, uncertainties and disturbances in control of these space systems? What are the commonly adopted control methods for such systems currently? So yeah, that's an excellent question. Yes, indeed. There, there is like, for example, the Astro B and even operating in a space environment where if you want to do a grasping maneuver, there could be some uncertainty in terms of the object that you want to grasp, where, which way is it going? Does it have a trajectory? Is, it, is the object that you're estimating, is it moving? Which, what, which direction is it moving in? And I think the disturbance is also in the image processing. 
So I think there's still, you know, there's, you have uncertainties and disturbances, I think, from multiple places. Um, in terms of the control methods, so this is also a really more of a philosophical question in terms of, you know, what are the commonly adopted control methods for this system or any system in general? So I think it's more of a rule of thumb in terms of, you know, designing a control system or adopting a control system for a particular type of systems where maybe it's good to try, maybe try different things that you're familiar with. And that's something we've been doing recently. For example, like I liked the talk, the previous talk about, you know, optimal control, uh, robust control, um, adaptive control. So I think there's, you know, there's a large number of different ones. And I, and I think it's really up to the designer sometimes where, you know, the application or the mission that they want to that they want to look into and see, you know, which control method would fit for this mission or for this requirement. But we've been looking recently into model predictive control, um, optimal control. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hisham. I think uh, we can expect the satellite and Mars in the next three years, <laughs> the Hisham <hope> so. uh, X. <laughs> <laughs>